Uh, Connor, good to chat to you again. How are we doing? You okay? I'm a bit sheepish because George and I picked our League One team of the season <laughs> so far on YouTube over the weekend. And, and George picked Connor Harahan in his midfield. And I decided you couldn't have Connor Harahan and Barry Bannon in the same midfield and went for Bannon. So I'm tail between my legs a bit. No, you're absolutely fine. Um, yeah, a bit, bit, bit of tongue, tongue in cheek, but uh, I really like uh, George's team compared to yours. And that's like. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about Derby County, uh, where you are currently 14 unbeaten in the league uh, with five wins in a row, absolutely cementing uh, a playoff spot as the sort of initial objective, albeit still a long way to go. Uh, and now, if anything, people talking about whether you guys can chase down that top three that have set such an amazing uh, pace at the top of League One. Uh, it must be a great place to work at the moment with with such a buzz and such good form. Yeah, it's amazing. It really, really is. Um, look, we're on, we're on a great run at the minute. Um, I think when the manager came in, firstly, it was like, right, can we get into the playoffs? Can we cement that? Um, and we feel like we're doing that game by game, week by week. Of course, at the run that we've been on, um, look, we've cranked it up a little bit and we've we've gone on an amazing unbeaten run, but we've turned a lot of draws into win at the start of that unbeaten run. There was quite a few draws at the start, which we weren't kind of making up the points and and and, and the gap we would like to, but no, obviously, we feel like we're, we're we're cementing that playoff place and looking up, of course, why not? You know what I mean? You've got a dream, you've got to believe. Um, and we'll see kind of over the next month to six weeks how much we close that gap. You know, we've got an interesting February, um, quite a few games, and then into the March period um, before the kind of international break. I know League One play over the international break. Um, and then it starts cranking up as, uh, again after that international break. So we'll see over that next six weeks if we can close that gap and how, how much we can close it. Um, and, and go from there, really. Which aspects of the team do you think are the strongest? I just think, look, um, we've got a manager, firstly, that's got huge experience of getting out with the league. Um, it took us a little bit maybe to gather his thoughts and ideas. Um, and, and I feel like we're really getting that now. Um, you know, he, he's a fantastic guy. Um, you know, I suppose results and, um, and points on the board will only breed confidence as well. And, and belief, like we just said. And Look, I think if we were sitting here and, and saying, look, oh, we'll be happy with the playoff place and, and, and we'll go from there. No, I think, look, we're, we're ambitious. We're, we're a big football club um, and we want to try and, and, and close that gap. Whether we will or not, time will tell. Um, but we feel like, why not? Let's have a go off it. And if not, then um, it pops, possibly might be the playoffs. But we, we've got to believe in it and, and try and, uh, and have that desire and, and determination to try and close that gap. It feels like... Tactically, Warren's put together a, a really slick unit, unsurprisingly very strong out of possession and very, very difficult to, to play through and to create good chances against you guys consistently. And then in possession, uh, kind of seems to me like there's a lot of different avenues of attack, like you score a lot of different types of goal and, and at top. It's the wide men who are thriving, but yourself and Maxi midfield have got a couple of goals as well. And and then a couple of the guys up front chipping in. So, um, yeah, how would you describe your role within what kind of looks on paper like a 4-4-2? Uh, you've played a lot of different midfield roles in your career so far. So talk to me about your role and, and, and how it sort of helps the team do what it needs to do. Yeah, I think originally when the manager came in, we were um, a midfielder in 2-8. Um, then Jason Knight got injured for a period of time for about six weeks. And we went to kind of a... Four four one one four four two, whatever you want to call it, um, with the goal and Collins up front. So I think in that formation, it kind of uh, didn't let me get forward as much as I would like. It would, it was, you know, more, more that old fashioned kind of four four two midfielders, kind of, you know, pick and choose your time, um, and recycle the ball out to the wingers and two strikers in the box and and what have you. So. And I think over the last maybe month now, Jason Knight has come back into the team and we've created that kind of, he plays as, as an out-and-out out 10. Mm -hmm. Sometimes in a game, we'll switch to two eights again and that gives me a lot more license then to get forward with, with Max Board kind of as your sitter. So uh, I think a big thing for us um, over the course of the run has been the defence and the keeper. I think they've been absolutely fantastic. We've had a, a settled back four over the last kind of two months. Um, I think the two centre-halves in particular and the keeper have been amazing. Mm -hmm. Um it kind of a master stroke from the manager um putting Craig Forsyth as a centre half. He's been he's been top, top class on top of the um emergence of Eric Cashin over the course of the season, who has been for me the best centre half in, in, in League One by by a distance. Um and then we've got we've got, you know, real quality on, on, on the flanks with Mendes and, and Barcus and Lewis Dobbin, obviously. Um and then we've got two, you know, 
goal scorers over the course of their career in, in, in Collins and McGoldrick as well. So it's it's been a nice mix. It's been a settled side as well. Not too many injur- injuries. Fingers crossed that keeps um, happening over the course of the, of the next six weeks. It, it, uh, you know, like I said, closing that gap, we're going to have, have to have a little bit of luck from that point of view. And um, we look a strong outfit at the minute, definitely. Yeah, we've mentioned a few times on the podcast, like to, to have the defensive record that you guys have, the amount of clean sheets, or if you're not keeping a clean sheet, just keeping the opposition at one and making sure that you're always in with a chance. And it's been a back four that on paper doesn't look like it has a ton of players in what people might think is a natural position. So Corey Smith at right back, Louis Sibley played left back a lot. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Forsyth you mentioned in the middle. And I guess that that does just go to show that if, if a manager... <clears throat> can get the structure right and can get the, the the whole shape right then just focusing on on one position that a player can play in can be quite sort of short-sighted I guess in the modern game because players can fulfill so many different roles I guess as long as the instruction is good uh, and the team around them are good enough then players can yeah. thrive in different positions yeah 100% I agree yeah I think if you've got you know the right manager with the right instructions with clear you know, detail uh, and there's a clear clarity kind of going out in the pitch. There's no grey areas. I can see, you know, Corey slipping into a right pack position. I know he's done it at Swansea a couple of times, a couple of times when I was at Swansea. Uh, I knew he'd thrive off it. I knew he'd be absolutely fine. Sibs on the other side, um, we had a couple of injuries and a, a left back and we, he was a, a wing back for a little bit. Then he slotted into a left back position. When the manager first came in, he was kind of seeing him as maybe a winger or a 10 or an eight. And he's he slipped into that left back position really, really well. He's done fantastic. So I think as a unit, um, and the keeper, they've done this amazingly well. Um, you know, regular clean sheets. And look, we're scoring goals as well. And that's the recipe that every manager wants to get, you know, solid at the back, clean sheets and scoring goals up the top of the pitch, you know, you're onto a good one. So um, yeah, I think they've the manager has found the right balance in his back four. Um, you know, possibly maybe stumbled across it, which a lot of managers do stumble across different formations and players in different areas. And it just seems to be, um, you know, hitting the right buttons at the minute and um, everyone seems to be thriving off it. It, it strikes me that that one of the the clear strengths in the, you know, the sort of general starting 11 or the, the group of 12, 13 that you've got is that going forward, you've got yourself and Max Bird in midfield. Both of you have fantastic passing range and, and are able to, to more or less put the ball wherever you want, certainly with your left foot. And, and dare I say it, Bird might be one of the most two-footed players yeah, yeah, I can remember in, in yeah, the EFL. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and in front of you, you've got that nice mixture of, of targets with different profiles. So, I mean, Mendes Lang and Barkhazen are some of the, the quickest, most direct and skillful wingers in the league. Um, and, you know, whether it's fizzing it, you know, out to them to isolate their fullback 1v1 or whether they're trying to make runs in behind, you're going to have that target on almost all the time if there's space in the defence. And then uh, in the middle, you've got either James Collins, who's obviously such an established uh, all-rounder type, but you can fizz it into him probably to feet or, or aerially. McGoldrick, one of the, the classiest with his feet in, in that position. And then Jason Knight, who I compared to Mason Mount the other day, just because he makes such smart runs into channels and pulls defences, um, you know, out of shape with his with his movement. So for you and Max, it's kind of like, well, over the course of a game, we're going to have tons of different opportunities to play a lot of different type of passes, which is difficult to defend against. Yeah, without, without um, we feel like we've got different weapons. Um, one that, I, that really has, has stood out this season, I was actually surprised maybe that, he didn't get into either of your teams, uh, as we as we touched on before, as Mendes Lang. I think he's been really, really good this year. Consistently, um, you know, positive in his play. Had you know, tore you know left backs, um, you know, game after game, in my opinion. And and looks like I said, a really strong dribbler, really strong runner, athletically, you know, up and down all game. Um, and 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 the fullback struggled to deal with him really. So he's been one that's been consistently good all year. Obviously, Didzi has, um, you know, the, the drops into pockets, which makes 90 spaces to run in behind. You know, the two wingers then can run in behind a little bit more because Didzi has your, is your kind of a link-up man. So, yeah, it look, it, it at the minute, obviously, we're talking positively about it and, and there's a good feel about it and, and, and things are going well, of course. And look, we just need to keep winning games. Um, like I said, injury fee is a big one. Uh, free is a big one for us. We don't have a huge squad. Um We've got a couple of people on the bench, obviously, of course, that can come in and change the games. Dobbin, uh, Lewis Dobbin did terrifically well against Port Vale, coming on for that kind of 20-minute period, setting up two goals. He was electric when he came on. 
Um, so yeah, um, I think that that would be a big one for us. Fingers crossed, we get that little bit of luck, and that's the case. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll we'll keep going from strength to strength, really. Uh, and just on Paul Warren, who obviously joined the club back in September, he's been synonymous with Rotherham United and had some incredible success with them. He's he's a a character and a personality that many find infectious and really interesting that someone uh, with that personality and, and with that openness and honesty can thrive as a manager in a, in a game where you know we're, we're constantly told it's it's a very very tough industry and it, and it can be difficult to show sort of honesty and vulnerability at times but um, that's the the personality of Paul Warren as we understand it and you know people like myself have been able to listen to the moment of truth podcast where you, you really do feel like you get to know him quite well is he a very different character and does he have quite a different approach to previous managers that you've worked under at your former clubs yeah he he is different um in terms of um how he goes about his day-to-day -day business with players um i think his ultimate strength in my opinion is his man management um he makes everyone feel well speaking from my experience he's only been you know warming and caring and and, and loving towards me and um, since he's come in i think he's been like that with, with everyone um you know, he's regularly text. I think you'll probably have heard in his interviews, he's regularly texting lads, regularly pra praising guys. Um, and he and 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 he knows how to get the best out of guys, uh, out of players. Um, he's so hands on with players, he's probably a little bit different to what I've had previously. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I've really, you know, grown a, a, an amazing connection with him, really. I, I, I really res respect him as a man, first and foremost, and how he handles guys um, and how he handles players. And then he's got a team around him that are, are are thrive off, you know, Richie Barker, the coaching side of things, who's really good as a coach. Um, Hammy's the same. He's got a, you know, they've got a really good balance in their team of coaches, um, who have all got their their strengths, and the manager leaves leaves them to to bring out their strengths um day to day. And um, like I said, they know how to get that balance right and they really work well together and, and the lads absolutely love working with them every day, yeah. In terms of from now until the end of the season, you know, you've already been pretty clear about how you guys are seeing it at the moment. You know, very, very high ambitions, um, but not getting blinded by automatic promotion, just making sure that you keep your own standards really high as they have been in the last couple of months. Um, if you do make it into the playoffs, could be some quite interesting opposition for you, uh, Connor Barnsley. Yeah. Uh, in yeah, yeah, there yeah. at the moment, um, former club of yours, Plymouth Argyle, currently top of League One, uh, of course. Um, what are your thoughts on on your two former clubs fighting at the top end of League One with you and Derby County? Yeah, look, it's great to see them there first and foremost. Um, delighted for for Barnsley. Um, you know they obviously got relegated and and people wanted them to to obviously get promoted straight away. And it, it's great to see them you know in and around the playoffs. Um, you know Plymouth, uh, you know a long time kind of in your League Ones and League Twos, and, and they're a big football club. But people people probably don't realise how big they are until you kind of go down there and 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 live there and play for them and, and see the you know the big club that they are and they're thriving there as well. Um you know we played Plymouth at home under the previous manager um Liam Senior and in my opinion they're probably one of if not the best club uh, team we've played this year. Thought they were a really good club, a, a really good team. We were winning 2-0 at, at at the time but it was one of them where you know they had all the ball, they had a lot of chances. We just kind of nicked two goals, probably our only two two chances of the game, um, and they came back second half and and won the game three two. But they were really good on the day, I have to say. So yeah, look, it's great for them to to be where they are. Um, Plymouth have just gone from strength to strength. So I, I I thought maybe will they keep up the pace and we'll see over the course of the second half of the season. But this seems like they're they're not stopping anytime soon. So um, yeah, look, it's great for them. Um, you know, two uh, previous clubs of mine who. I've only got fondness for um, who were an amazing part of my journey. So, um, you know, delighted to see them where they are. Two of the other teams that are up there, Ipswich Town and Sheffield Wednesday, um, yeah. both set pretty incredible pace as well this season. I'm really interested to know from a player's perspective, having, you know, taken on these two teams, what what are the what are the differences in in them as an opponent? What are the differences, different things that you need to think about playing against Ipswich Town, playing against Sheffield Wednesday? I think um, Sheffield Wednesday and uh, Ipswich, we've obviously played them uh, not so long ago. Uh, we lost to Ipswich 1-0 at Portman Road on Sky. A really difficult game. I, I felt like their squad was a really good squad. I, I felt like they were bringing on players that were established. League 1 played in the champ uh, players, you know, so same with Sheffield Wednesday. They were bringing on, you know, 
you know, Callum Patterson's and mm-hmm. uh, Lee Gregory's and all these kind of guys, you know, established championship, you know, League One players um, who have had amazing careers. So I think their squads are, are are a big thing for them. You know, if they, I touched on on us, if we get injured to a couple of players, we may struggle with numbers where with them, if they get a couple of injuries, say, for instance, Baz got injured and they've just gone from strength to strength, no problem, because they've brought in probably, you know, just as good as a player. So, um, you know, they've obviously got qualities. Uh, Sheffield Wednesday have, you know, kept clean sheets, uh, scored up the top of the pitch, like I said, for similar to us, winning formula, consistently done it over the season more than us. And same with Ipswich, consistently done it more, more than us, got off to a very good start and trying to keep up the pace that they've set. So, look, um, really good managers as well, you know, Kieran McKenna, um, you know, Darren Moore, you know, great managers in the role, right, as well. So, it's going to be difficult to, to, to catch them, but um, we'll give it our best go. Um, but they're, they're really good, strong squads. I think that's one of their big strengths. Um, any injuries, they can bring in some really good players as well. Either way, whichever four teams make the playoffs in May, that is going to be one of the most exciting playoff pictures that I can remember. Uh, fun fact, Connor, uh, prove that I do do some research before these things. <laughs> yeah. When I think of you, I think of being involved in a lot of playoff campaigns yeah, in recent yeah, years. With, yeah, with there must Villa. have been many more than me, surely. It, yeah, so uh, using the website Transfer Marked, which goes back to about 2004, um, you can see who's played the most championship playoff games and you no one's played in more than you in the last 20 years. All right, years. okay. There's about right, four or five of you that have played 10 championship playoff games. Um, uh, Richard Keogh is definitely one of them. Uh, there's one right. or two others as well. But yeah, you are definitively one of the most experienced yeah. players yeah, in, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. EFL playoffs. So there, there yeah. you go. Do you, do you sort of... <laughs> Do you relish that the thought of playing in more or are you like, come on, give me an easy life? Yeah, look, I'd love a top two. I would absolutely love it. You know, I've had um, a couple of promotions in, in my career, obviously, and look, they've been amazing. Um, obviously, through the playoffs, uh, I'd love an early summer, you know, going, getting that little bit older. Now, I'm 32 in a few days, so my legs could do with a summer off. Um, look, yeah, look, playoffs are amazing, of course. I've been involved in quite a few of them now, uh, a few that I've won, quite a few a few others that I've lost. Um, and they're amazing to be a part of. Great when you win, rubbish when you lose them, of course. But I'd love I'd love a top two before I finish my career, whenever that may be in the next three, four years, whatever, you know, um, you know, you hear of lads, Sheffield United, obviously they've had a, a couple of top twos um when I was there and they they speak of how great it was and whatever. So I'd love to experience a top two and kind of do it at your you know, your home ground or an away ground or whatever it may be and having that extra couple of weeks off in your summer. So let's see what happens, but um, I'll take any promotion at the same time. Uh, you mentioned, you know, getting towards the end of your career. I think you said three or four years there, which I was very pleased to hear. As you say, just about to turn <laughs> 22, uh, just about to turn... I wish, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> just about to turn 32 and still clearly thriving and, and playing very well. So certainly not trying to usher you into retirement, but there was something I wanted to, to ask you about before we let you go. And that is your future ambitions. Um, yeah. I, we've got a mutual friend called Phil and I was chatting to him late last week about uh, John Messina, who, who yeah, went yeah. straight from a playing contract at Oxford yeah. into the, the dugout at, uh, at Portsmouth. And, and when I was speaking to Phil, he said, and I, I hope you don't mind me sharing what no, he said. No, he, no, no problem. he said, that's what Connor wants to do. That is what yeah. Connor Harahan. That's how he would like, you know, his the transition from from playing to management going. So, uh, is that true? <laughs> is that yeah, something no, that you look at and you think, okay, this could be of interest to me one day? Yeah, hundred percent. And first and foremost, um, you know, the John Massino thing. I absolutely loved it. I must, I must admit, I really, really hope he does well. Um, you know, to go from that tr- transition from a player to a manager, um, I'll be really watching it with a close eye. So, firstly, I, I wish him nothing but the best. Um, yeah, it, that's something that I want to do. Um, funnily enough, I'm, I'm starting my A license tonight. Um, coaching. Um, obviously, I'll miss the first night of it because we've got our own game. Um, you know, it's something that I've got a real, real passion for and, and desire for. Uh, I coach once, twice a week at the minute. Um, here regularly. Um. You know, I'm always kind of, I think differently about the game now a little bit. I'm always watching interviews from managers rather than watching interviews from players. Um, you know, I've got a kind of a training session logbook and Bible that I that I write down a lot on. Um, and it's something that I'm really got a half an eye on for um, when uh, when I finish. Um, I did my B licence over the course of COVID. 
and that was my kind of first um, look into the coaching side of it. And since then, I've come a little bit obsessed with it, if I'm being honest. So it's something that I've got a half an eye on. Um, whether When that time will be, let's wait and see. But it's something that I'm definitely, definitely going to go into when I finish, yeah, for sure. What else do you, what do you need? What are the licenses that you need to hold in order to, so, for example, be a manager in the EFL? Yeah, so basically, uh, for the people that may be listening, I did my, um, so to start off with, you do your level one and two. Um, I did that with Sunderland in, in the, my apprenticeship. So I'm not sure if that's part of the program anymore with this, with apprenticeships or not. So I did my level one or two um, when I was at Sunderland in my youth team. Then you go on to your B license, um, which I did over COVID. There was an opportunity for me to do it. And I thought, absolutely, what a time to do it. You know, not much is going on. So we did it over Zooms and I had to do um, some recording of sessions when, when the world came back open and, and, and send it off. So I did that with the FAI. Then you go on to your A license, which is a bit more intense. It takes, we're starting it tonight for the first night. Um, and it, it, hopefully over the course of this calendar year, I'll be finished towards the end of it, maybe November, December. And then you go on to your pro license, um, which is the kind of the ultimate finish of your coaching. So mm -hmm. you can get a manager's job as an A license, uh, with an A license. Um, and then you can kind of do your pro while you're in, in a manager's or coaching role. Um, so yeah, I think... John Massino, from, from what I've heard, um, met the chief exec of Portsmouth on his pro license. Mm. Um, so you never know who you're going to meet along your coaching journey. So, yeah, so I'm starting my A license tonight. I'm doing a little bit of coaching in the area um, on a Tuesday night when I don't have a game and on a Thursday night. It's something that I absolutely love um, away from the playing side. So, um, yeah, it's um, something that the wheels are in motion for and something I've got. Uh, I'm slowly preparing for the, the more I finish. One of the things that we spoke about on last week's podcast about Mourinho's appointment was that, albeit it, it looks extreme, if you just use the line, he's gone from playing at Oxford to managing at, at Portsmouth, it kind of misses what's been two and a half, three years for John Mourinho, where he's he's sort of had a bit of a mixed role at Oxford. You know, he hasn't mm -hmm. played very, yeah, very yeah. much league football. He was able to find a club that allowed him to, I guess, observe and learn a lot and have some responsibility. I know that he took some responsibility for the set pieces at Oxford this season. And right. that strikes me as such, that would be such a nice situation for someone in his position and potentially your position to have uh, maybe something to, to talk to Paul Warren and his staff about over, yeah. the, over the next few months. Yeah, look, I think it would be definitely something that I'd be interested um, in. Um, I feel, look, I'm, I'm turning 32 now. I feel like I've got a couple of good seasons left in me, definitely for sure. Um, and I think, uh, look, without exactly putting a timeline on it, maybe when I become 34, 35, I would like maybe a, a player coach role somewhere or something just to have that year of bidding into that transfer of rather than going player coach. Like you said, John Messina had that kind of bidding in period, which I probably he'd speak that was vital for him, you know. So that's something that I'd like to do maybe in a couple of seasons time. Um, like I said, a couple of good seasons in me yet playing wise. But like I said, the wheels are in motion slowly and um it's something that I'm passionate on. It's something that, look, when I was, before doing my B license, I was like, well, I like it, well, I won't. And I'm delighted that I've become a little bit obsessed with it because it doesn't make me, you know, I used to, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, fear finishing a little bit. Now I'm kind of, don't have that fear anymore. It's more excitement that my next journey is kind of going to take place whenever that time may be. So, um, yeah, we'll see how the next couple of years go playing wise. But like I said, half an eye on and the coaching when I finish. Good. Well, it's good to hear from our perspective. We've enjoyed talking about Connor Harahan. I'm pretty sure we pronounced it wrong for about three or four years. So apologies for <laughs> yeah, yeah, got yeah. it right eventually. Before we... um before I go, a quick one. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you for a pr prediction because um we'll have a bit of a laugh about it come the end of the season. <laughs> okay. Do you think do you think we can make the top two or what do you reckon? Who will finish in the top two? I don't think you're gonna make the top two. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you've absolutely gone straight fair face, no chance. I love it. Well, you know that's going to add fuel to the fire now. You know that, don't you? We've spoken enough to know that I know you're going to be honest with me and I, <laughs> I can be honest with you. Oh, I love it. I love it. I think the pace that's been, that's been set is just yeah. could be very difficult. I mean, it's eight points at the moment between yourselves and Wednesday in second. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Do you think I, they'll finish both there or not? I, I don't think the gap will be any bigger than eight points. I could see it being a bit smaller than eight points, but they're, they're right. so they're all, you're all so strong. They just yeah. have that bit of a head start, right? Um, I think right now I probably do feel like it will be 
Argyle and Sheffield Wednesday. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. How could you not say it, I suppose, when they look they do look strong, don't they? Yeah. And and you know, we've we've done so many predictions over the last few years. And one thing I've become so aware of is like how much the last few results impact your your yeah. predictions for the long term. So, like for example, I've left Ipswich out of my of my top two, but I fancied right. them all year preseason, all the start of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah just yeah. the last two weeks where I'm like, is yeah, there yeah. some is there Something, some yeah, issue? Yeah, of course. And it might be that they crank out five wins in a row now. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. You just never know. I know, I know, I know. I think I think for us it will be how we'll have to take points off the, the teams up there when we play them to try and narrow that gap, in in my opinion. Uh, I don't think we could play Sheffield Wednesday, Ipswich or, or Plymouth and lose and, and lose more ground again. You know what I mean? Mm. So uh, we actually play Sheffield Wednesday on the last game of the season in Hillsborough. So that could be wow. an interesting one. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> and I'm looking at Ipswich on the 1st of April. That one's at, at yeah. Derby. I might see if I can come up for that one because that would be so Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Yeah, that'd be great. No problem at all. Um, well, thank you so much. You're always so good with us and, and for giving us your time and, and sharing so much with us, Connor. It's, it's been a treat as always. No problem. Pleasure just buzzing that we're going to be able to talk about you as a manager for 40 years after talking about you as a player for 10. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if my uh, manager Ryan, ha- hangs on that long, but no, it's something that I'm <laughs> definitely going for, yeah. All right, Connor, go well. Thank you. Cheers, thank you.